Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. Today's talk is called Get Lost Time Series. My name is David Mackay. You can find me on Twitter, our Slack channel, and our forums as at raw code. I'm a developer advocate at Influx Data. There's some things about me that hopefully are interesting. I'm Scottish, that's my accent. I inherited a lot of pets. This meant that I met my now wife. We had ferrets, dagos, chinchillas, dogs, fish, hamsters, and now I get to look after them too. I'm a big fan of esoteric programming languages. My current favorite languages are Rust, Pony, and Crystal. And I'm very much excited for the, June, the new June movie. It's my favorite sci-fi novel, and I'm very happy to see that hopefully there'll be a good movie of it eventually. All right, so let's kind of build a base understanding first. Time series is everywhere. When we try and describe time series to people, you know, it's very easy to stick to a very few common examples. But when we say that time series data is any piece of data that has a timestamp on it, that actually correlates to any event within the real and physical world. Right? When you go to sleep, when you wake up, the chances are you have a Fitbit, an Apple Watch, or a phone. And that is constantly trying to work out when you go to sleep, when you wake up, it knows when you snore, it knows when you roll over through sensification. And it can actually try to grade your sleep and tell you how well you're sleeping or how poorly you're sleeping so that you can make the changes that you need to make to get a better sleep. And of course, when you walk down the street, you know, back when that used to be a thing, is that it would track your steps. And we'd all aim for 10,000 steps per day because that's what people recommend to be healthier. And it can actually do cumulative sums across weeks, days, months, years, I'm trying to tell you when you're most active, which day of the week, it could be that day that you take a walk to your friend's house. And even right now, as I'm giving this talk, there are many cars going past my window. Now, if I was smart, I may have decided to track all of those cars and find the quietest time to do this recording, but unfortunately, we're stuck with now. And as part of my, my time at Influx Data, I've been to a lot of events and trade shows, and I spoke with many, many people that are used in time series data. And I think a common thread that I found is that people generally apply time series data and analysis within a very narrow scope. For instance, people that I speak to that work for banks, they generally are tracking the price of stocks or cryptocurrencies, are tracking the interest rates across cities, countries, uh, and, and they want to understand how to get the most return on their investment. And when I speak to developers or operations people, anyone with a computer science background, you know, nine times out of 10, all they're doing is using time series to understand the Linux systems, their services, and their APIs and applications. You know, we group this under monitoring and observability. And I think that we're barely scratching the surface of what we can do with all of this time series data. And I don't think we really understand just how much time series data we have, even within the computer science context itself. So the overarching theme for today is how can we widen the scope of time series within the computer science context? What novel things can we do to help us be better developers, be better colleagues, and build better software? All right, so today's example should be no surprise based on the title of the talk. Is we're going to use Git. Why? Because it's already got all of those timestamp things baked in, right? Git is an audit log of all the developer activity within one or more repositories. Through that, we have access to the deltas, which tell us what changed from each uh, commit within the history. And alongside that, we get some metadata. We know who, uh, who sent the commit. We can look at the, the commit message itself, try and understand what the intent of that commit was. And by looking at the deltas within the code, we can look for certain markers within the code to help us identify comments, which will hopefully reveal the thought process or what the developer was doing. And also test markers, so we can try to understand how well the code is tested. And what I want to be able to do is to just use this Git history to help build and derive an understanding of the people on the project, the migration path of that code over time, I want to try and get an understanding for the velocity of the project, how fast is it releasing and where is it going? And I'm not going to cover that today just due to time constraints, but can we use those comment and test markers to understand how well the code is tested and um, how well it is documented? 
just to understand the health or maturity of the repositories themselves. So the project that I've written to do this is called Get Series. And there are two repositories online, I'm really sorry. I did try to write this in Rust. And unfortunately, the libget2 library that I use to analyze the commits does not support async await in Rust. Which meant when I was analyzing slightly larger repositories, like the Linux kernel and Kubernetes, I really, really struggled to process through the entire ref log. So I had to jump back to Go, and just because concurrency is a first-class citizen, the Git library supported it, and it made everything 10 times faster. In fact, much more faster. So I do plan to go back to the Rust one. I will try and get it feature parity with the Go one, but both are available if you want to go and take a look. I will also add that the demos that I am about to show are all open source as well, and the link to that repository is on the final slide. Now, this talk is primarily just going to be me looking at graphs and dashboards and showing you what we can learn from Git. And hopefully it's going to be slightly interesting, a little bit of fun, and hopefully open up your eyes to the potentials of what we can understand through this data. I barely think that I'm scratching the surface, and I think there's a lot more that can be done with this. But this is where I am today. Okay, dashboard one, what do we see? This is the Git series overview dashboard. We can see here that we're looking at seven years of data, just over seven years of data. That is the entire lifetime of InfluxDB repository. The first commit was in April-ish 2013. We have a window period specified as a quarter. And just so that we can take a, a kind of overview look at this data, we don't want to get too deep yet. Now, We'll come back to this graph in a moment, but what we can see are just some high level numbers. We can see that over the last seven and a half years, these repositories have had nearly 40,000 commits. And we can see that over the window, the quarters, three months, that there are on average 1,300 commits. Oh. Now we have an understanding of the size and the history, the legacy of the project. And when we look at the graph, what we can see is zero commits here up to 125. So 125 commits in the first quarter. And then we have a nice little spike. Uh, a nice little spike. And you can see those commits kind of increasing quite quickly, up to 700 per quarter. And then here, it increases to nearly 2,000 per quarter. And now, when I first seen this, it got me thinking. Now, I work for Influx Data, and I know vaguely some of the history of the company. What I wasn't entirely sure of is when did the company seek funding? I tried to kind of guess based on this graph, and I got most of them correct, which I found quite interesting. Now, the seed round was here. There's growth from kind of 100 to 200 commits up to 700 and a quarter. And then the a, Series A round was here, where we can see that growth. <coughs> and I think what happened here was obviously the company raised it to Series A. There are articles written about that. And I think there's a very healthy community of people online that want to contribute to early open source companies that are raising money. And I think that's why we raise from 500 commits per quarter to nearly 2,000. As well, of course, the company growing in size as they hire people to come and work on the product. Now, there are two or more raises inside of this graph. They are visible. So I'll give you just 10 seconds to see if you can identify them. And then after this talk, you can go look that up in Crunchbase and see if you were correct. All right, let's move on. So I should say this is the collective repositories that InfluxDB has open, or at least I'm analyzing three of them. So when we break that down, we can see the inception of each of these projects. So we've already covered the inception of InfluxDB in early 2013. We can see that after the company raised the Series A, they began to work on like the full stack monitoring solution. And that involved development of Telegraph, which we see here. And most recently, in 2018, the company decided that they wanted to bring new life into the query side of time series data. And we're doing that through the inception of Flux. And we can see the growth as that product was kind of being iterated on and new features being added. But really nice to get an overview of when the products were first developed, the growth of those, the commits over time, and we can really see the changes here as the company is growing in size. Okay, now, commits are one thing, but what about contributors? You know, we are an open source company. So it'd be really good if we could have an understanding 
of how many people are actually contributing to the product. So there's a caveat here. Now, it would be really nice if everyone that worked at Influx Data committed with an Influx Data email address. Unfortunately, that is not the case. So I cannot group to show internal versus external contributions. That may be different for your organization and you may have more success by breaking this down. There wasn't something that I was able to do across these repositories. What we're looking at is just total contributors regardless of whether they're internal or external. And again, we see those number of contributors really ramping up after that Series A round. In fact, over the last seven and a half years, there have been 1,200 contributors to the projects. And that works out roughly at 75 per quarter. Okay, now let's break that down across repositories. So NFOXDB is the only repository here, so of course there's the only one that's going to have contribution. What we see with Telegraph here is that it never really started at one line. It really quickly went up to like 17 and 20 and 30. So that just kind of maybe gives me an indication there was a bit of a push internally within the company to get that to a working status. And then development kind of backed off a little bit and it's been relatively consistent and they're moving forward with the core team of developers ever since. And then we can see Flux again as this initial flurry of activity, um, only eight people, but still, you know, initial flurry of activity as people were trying to get this off the ground. And then we see it kind of slowing down, having some conversations, and then coming back to that, that iteration phase. And of course, this little dip here just correlates with the Christmas period as well. And once we understand the contributors, what about the releases? Can we analyze the Git tags to work out um, how often we release new versions of the software? Now, from a global perspective, this graph is it's kind of useful to see if releases are a thing, but really it doesn't get interesting until we break that down by product again. And what we see here is a high number of releases every quarter within InfluxDB in the early days. That shows volatility, or at least a period of kind of inception and thought processes and changes and trying to find out where product market fit is and all these other things. The regular release and fast release cadence there is really beneficial because it means that people have a chance to play with new features and collect feedback and continue to iterate and iterate. And of course, as the project matures, it's going to slow down with those releases. And then as the product maybe goes through another phase of, okay, let's make a few changes to the API. Now, I don't know for certain because I haven't looked it up, but this could be pre 1.0 where they were starting to then push towards that. And then things seem to stabilize as we move forward. Now, of course, what is really interesting here is that as 2.0 has been worked on, we're back into this volatility stage as we're continually releasing and iterating. And we see that with Flux as well. And what I find really cool about Telegraph is it seems to have always maintained a really regular cadence of releases. In fact, there's not a lot of randomness here. They're very consistent, seem to be releasing very regularly, patches and majors. Um, and that seems to be working really well. And of course, that's because they're two very different style of products. Telegraph being very plugin centric and InfluxDB being more of a core product. Now, because we have all of this data in InfluxDB, it means we actually have different visualizations that we can leverage to understand this data. Not all data is best viewed as a graph. And I think as a scatter plot, we can actually see that volatility early on in InfluxDB with the kind of spread of these little purple crosses. We can see the consistency of Telegraph with the uh, orange triangles. And then again, we see the volatility of Flux and 2.0 as we approach 2019 and onwards. But I think the most telling view for release information was the histogram. We see InfluxDB, lots of releases early on. We can see that consistent orange of Telegraph right across the board. And then Flux kind of sneaking in at the 2019 onwards with that really fast iteration phase and many, many releases. Okay, so we've covered commits, contributors, and releases. But what about the code itself? Now, because Influx data is pretty much a go shop, this purple line is all of the Go code. <laughs> uh, from the first day till the present day, there is a lot of Go code being thrown around. Now, what we can identify from this graph is when documentation was beginning to become a bit more serious. Now, there's a little flurry of it down here, but what we actually see is the markdown and the number of commits with markdown changes in it rising drastically from 2015 moving forward. And that's, again, a sign of maturity within the project that documentation is becoming much more of a first-class citizen. 
And InfluxDB decided to start working on their own UI. And we can see the inception of that too in late 2016 with all of this JavaScript code climbing up. Now, what I found even more interesting here was that heavy decline towards the end of 2018. And what does that mean? Well, it means we're not writing as much JavaScript anymore. But however, we see a lot of increase in TypeScript activity. And what we can see at a glance here is that although InfluxDB is a Go shop with lots of Go, we started to mature and write lots of documentation. But as we developed the UI, we made a migration from JavaScript to TypeScript. And we can see more TypeScript code here. And as, if we dive in, we can see the inception of Flux in 2019. And there's even a special little Rust line down here somewhere. There we go. As the company is beginning to investigate how we can use Rust within our repositories, especially within Flux. Okay, now, if we had more than three repositories or we were more of a polyglot company that was iterating and playing with more languages, then we'd be able to break that down by repository here. And we can just see the influx data as all go. We can see uh, got some Telegraph Markdown, Telegraph Go, TypeScript, and the influx DB, and we can see all the flux stuff. So, you know, we can break that down and divide that even more to get an understanding of multiple repositories. But because the stack is quite uniform in influx data, we're not going to get a lot of information from this one at the moment. But finally, I think all these graphs are kind of you know, fun to look at. It gives you a nice overview, a history lesson of what happened within the company. But we still want this data to actually provide insights to people. Now, one of the most challenging things when you join a company can be how do I get help with a certain language if you know, the company has many languages active at any one time? And we can do that through the commit history. So, you know, there is a, a small insurgence of Rust happening here. If we click on the extension for Rust, we can actually see if I want to have a conversation with someone that is committing Rust to the repositories, then my best bet here is, well, no reply at github.com, which is brilliant, um, or Joshua or Nathaniel. Joshua with 160 commits in Rust and Nathaniel with 30. So I know how to go and get help with these new languages that I maybe have a bit of an interest in. Or maybe I just want to understand how they're being used. If I want to understand that TypeScript migration, I can come in here and I can see that if I want to go and discuss TypeScript, I can go and speak to Desa or Chris or Watts. These are the best people. So we can discover and help ourselves by analyzing these commits from a nice broad overview without too much effort. Now the next graph that I want to take a look at, or the next dashboard, is just the kind of a single repository deeper dive. Right? We've had a nice global overview and that was helpful, but what can we do by looking at a single repository? So I've kept this uh, window period of seven and a half years. <laughs> we have the window, sorry, we have the, they have the time range of seven and a half years. We have the window period of monthly and we're only looking at the InfluxDB repository. Now this first graph is very similar to the last dashboard. Only now we've broken down the commits not by repository, but by the number of insertions and deletions in the commit, as well as the number of files modified within a commit. And that allows us to understand cycles within the application development. What we see here earlier on, when these lines are relatively close together, it just means the code is changing, right? The same amount of insertions, the same amount of deletions means you're only modifying existing code. What we see here when the blue line is above the purple line means that we're writing only new code or at least much more new code than we're changing or deleting. And this pike here actually shows either a large refactoring or a major cleanup or extraction of something to an open source library. We can see there was a lot of code removed here and very little insert. And we can see that there's also a small insertion bump afterwards. So, you know, you can try and build your conclusions or you can even speak to people to try and understand what happened there. And when we see this insertion followed by a major deletion, we've either had a revert, where the code we're unhappy with and we've taken out, or we've just you know, rewritten something from start and written it again because it was better. It could just be a very large refactoring where we've run both concurrently and then made a switch over, maybe an A-B test or something else. Again, hard to tell, but we can get an indication of timeframes, and we could break that down to commits to understand who we go and speak to to understand what happened here. Now, of course, this is over a very large time range of seven and a half years. If you were doing this in your own repositories, you may want to continually iterate and look at this over three months. 
Okay, now what we see here are just more changes and iterations. You can see this blue line above the purple frequently, and that's as we're pushing forward with 2.0. And we can also see the actual branch will switch over. This is when we took all of the 1.x code out of the master branch and it was only 2.x. And I think that's what that massive deletion here is. Right, let's skip over the big numbers, right? We don't really mind, or we don't really, we're not interested in the total commits and the mean commit. We already looked at that on a global level. But what I think can be really interesting, again, for someone new coming to a company, how do we commit? What does a standard commit look like at this company? So we've analyzed all the commits across seven and a half years. Again, you'd probably want to do this over three months or six months, but right now we're doing seven and a half years. And what we can see is the 90th, the 50th, and the 25th percentile. So if I want to know what an average commit looks like, I'm running right along this middle, middle, uh, middle set of numbers. But I can assume that we have relatively small commits at InfluxDB. We can modify normally two files, maximum of seven. And we usually insert and delete in, you know, under 20 lines of code, but nowhere more than 200. So we can see that we're really focusing on smaller commits, easier to review. Now, if we scroll down, we can see the release cadence for this individual repository. Again, we're highlighting the volatility early and then a little bit now as we push towards GA of 2.x. But we can also understand the tags and we can see who is a release manager for that cup. So we can see that we're continually pushing out betas of 2.0. We can also see that we're still pushing 1.7 and 1.8. We're still incrementing, we're still maintaining and nurturing that 1.x product. <coughs> Okay, so what about the people? Who contributes to this repository? Now, the one of the reasons we're looking at this over such a large time range is just so that we can see the people come and go. Right? I really want to understand products in the company. And what I can see is that the first committer was Ben Johnson. And we can see that he's been a very steady committer over the entire life of the project. So when we talk about domain experts, he might be the person that we want to go and speak to because he has led through all of the changes that affect this repository. We can also see other names as they come and go. Now, we're going to look here. We've got John, we've got Philip, and we've got Cody. What we see are very large spikes and, and contributions and then tailing off. Now, the sheer size of those contributions would be an indicator to me that they're former employees, and I can actually see when they leave. I'm not 100% confident, I don't know these names, but I'm assuming these people were employed for these windows and then moved on from the company. What we can also see is our founder, Paul Dix, was very active in the development stage for the first two years, and then obviously took a step back as the company raised money and focused more on vision and management and leadership. Another really cool thing we can see from this graph, and it's difficult, especially as we get down to 2019, but just the density of these lines is an indicator at the size of the community and the company. So we can see there is relatively a decent amount of density in 2015 and 2016. But really, the, the company exploded in size in late 2018 and in 2019. There are just lots and lots of lines that are popping up here. Another thing we can see is that maybe the commit patterns have changed over the years. If we take a look at 20, you know, 2015, we have a lot of commits by one or two ind individual people. We then have more lots of commits by individual people, but more people. And then actually, as the company has grown in size and these, num these number of lines have multiplied, people are committing less. And that just hopefully shows me that there's a, a culture of pairing and smaller, uh, hopefully smaller commits, but more pairing and, and more of a collaboration and more uh, planning involved. And it's not just slang and code day after day after day, but you know, always looking at the long-term vision of the product. That's very healthy and good to see. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Next, I decided we've broken this down by people. Um, let's analyze the commit message. What can we understand from the commit messages that people provide? Now, this blue bit just means I was unable to parse the commit. And there's a reason for this. In late 2018, the company made the decision that they would start to um, adopt conventional commits or semantic commits, depending on how you know it. And it's a certain format for the message that allows us to indicate what the commit is trying to do, whether it's a feature or a fix, but also the component within the repository that it's actually working on. So if we come down here and we just kind of filter out all of that blue, and then we just zoom into a time frame here, 
based on the commit messages, we can see here this flow and cadence of feature delivery, but also this flow and cadence of fixes. Obviously, as a company, we're releasing more features, but we're also fixing stuff right afterwards as well. Again, very healthy to see feature and fix running side by side as the, as the, the changes are being incremented on. And we can also see there's also chores, and we've also got refactoring. What I really like, if I just try and zoom in a little bit more, is these, pe uh, these peaks and the, the chores and refactoring bubbles actually coincide with the company all hands. So people are obviously getting together and putting together a really concrete effort to try and improve the, the code base by sharing ideas and then pushing commits. Those commits might even come a little bit later, like we can see on some of the peaks, but still very close and, and correlatable to the all hands. And with semantic commits, conventional commits, we can filter out the blue again of things we couldn't parse, and we can come down here to analyze what is being worked on. So what we actually see here is that under really heavy development through 2018 and 2019 was the HTTP component of InfluxDB. It just means that we're working on the HTTP server, we're working on performance, compression, you know, the APIs are evolving. We can also see that really heavy increase in activity around the UI component from 2019 as we start to really iterate and deliver more features to the dashboarding. And we can also see that we worked on you know, the tasks component. A big feature in InfluxDB2 is the fact that we give you the ability to run and schedule tasks to work on your time series data. And we can see that development over time and when it was of higher priority than maybe other components. And we already seen on the overview dashboard how we can filter by extension. But I decided just to take that a little bit further. So I'm not going to filter an extension here, but I'm going to take a look at two more tables. Now, because InfluxDB2 is a mono repository, that means there are many components within there that people are working on. Now, lately, the company has been focused on our packager component, or at least there has been a focus on the packager component, a component that allows us using YAML to declaratively define our dashboards, our tasks, our variables, and all those other features so that we can apply them from the command line. So if you're interested in that component, as someone new within the company and you want to go and speak to the developer, you want to understand where that component is going, you want to understand how you can help perhaps, then you can filter by that component and we can see here that the top 600 commits are by Johnny. So right away I know who I need to go and speak to if I want to understand where Packager is going to be in three months and how I can help deliver that value. And as repositories get larger, it may be important to actually understand who is the code owner for something very specific. Now, because InfluxDB is a database, there's a lot of very intricate components to that database component. One of them being the series file. How do I track series over the whole database? And there might only be a handful of people, like we can see here, that have ever modified that file. And by just filtering on TSDB series file, I can come in and say, OK, if I want to understand this component more, or this file more, and how this works with the database, I probably want to go speak to Ben or Ed, who have pretty much 90% of the commits within that file. And maybe it's slightly less useful, especially over seven and a half years, because there's a lot of commits inside of this table. But if I want to understand how a component has changed over time, and we have that access to the conventional commits, then I can actually take a look at Packager and see that, well, all the recent commits are chores, they're cleaning up stuff, they're fixing stuff, this feature being uh, delivered here. And if you click on this, you just get a table here. You just see the author, the date and time of the commit. We can see that message in full, and we have access to the SHA. I could just copy and paste that SHA, drop back down to my default tooling, and take a look at that commit. So you can kind of understand how or what commits have been added to this clearly. Even just saying, oh, look, notification endpoint, metric service, label association. We can see the development of that individual component. OK, so next we have file extensions. Again, we can see JavaScript falling off the cliff. We see TypeScript coming up. We're not going to focus any more time on that. What I want to come back to is this idea of the conventional component. Now, if you remember from the dashboard, just you know, a little bit up from here, we had those big blue bars. Those big blue bars that we know nothing about because we couldn't parse it in a conventional, we couldn't parse it to a conventional commit format. Now, is there another way that we can actually get that information? And there is. And the way that we do that is by taking a look at the directories the code changed. 
Now, because this is the Go project, what we can see here is that all of the code changed in the early days was just on the root directory. Right? Not ideal, but it's the way things are done in the Go community. And what we see a little bit later is a flurry of activity as new directories are created. Now, obviously, 2014, at least the start, uh, sorry, the end of 2013, is when someone decided or a conversation was had we need to refactor this code. We need to break it down into smaller components. And we see this server component, we see the happy, we see the protocol, we see the HTTP layer, we see the data store, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of refactoring happened here into the individual components. And we can actually see some of those components are still being modified today a little bit. Now, we can see this big blue line again. There's still a lot of activity happening within the root directory. But we do see that you know, the command aspect of InfluxDB, we can actually see that was created at the end of 2014. It actually didn't change again at the end of 2015 until 2019. We can see that the command component just worked with 1.x and it wasn't until 2.x we actually started to have, we had to start making changes. Now, you can see a little bit of density in these lines and these directories that just shows us how much division of code there was. But of course, you can see it as the project matures, we can actually see the density getting a little bit unruly. And again, that's as InfluxDB decided to adopt a mono repository format and brought the UI and the collection and all of that into a single repository. We can see all of these components by directory and by line. And we can see the TSDB itself. You know, the first TSDB engine wasn't written until the middle of 2015, and it's still something that we have to wait on until today. So we can also filter the extensions by new code only, and we can just see what the languages are over time. <coughs> Excuse me. And I actually found a really nice way of viewing this was again through the use of scatterplot. So we can see these blue circles just indicate that we're modifying Go code within the root directory. And we can see that the blue is pretty persistent on its own, all the way up until 2018 almost. And that just shows that you know, only Go code existed in this repository. And it wasn't until the adoption of the mono repo and the build out of the UI that we see these other colors really starting to perk up and we've seen much more of it. And that just shows that the mono repository evolution happened from 2018 moving forward. We can track code deleted over time and we can track deleted by directory. So, you know, depending on what you're trying to discover, what, you, what questions you have about the code base, then you can just use these graphs as a way to narrow in on some of that information. Okay, so the last graph on this page, oh, the last two graphs. I used the comment markers to just try and build out an understanding of how much code and comments do we have. Now, with all early stage projects, of course, the, you know, down here, the blue line is pretty prominent. We're only writing code, very little comments. Now, I can't tell you what the golden ratio of code to comment is because I don't know myself. You just have to kind of see if you're happy with it, and then if you're not, then you want to start working and getting that purple line up. But what we do see here is that, you know, there are bursts of activity around comments within code. Um, but it wasn't until really our 2.0 release that comments were, were really making a much bigger um, kind of impact on the code itself. So you can see a lot more comments within the code as the company was growing in size in 2019. New, pa new faces were coming in with new ideas, conversations were happening. And people were documenting that through comments on it. It was really nice to see that in the project in the later days. And if we want to just understand which type of files are being commented, then we can see here that Go, right? Because most of the code is written in Go, we're going to get a lot of comments there. We can see the TypeScript is well documented. And because the comment marker code is not very sophisticated, uh, Markdown sneaks in as well. So, you know, you're not going to get a great picture, but you get enough numbers that you can start to push it in the right direction based on what you need from it. Then the final dashboard that I want to show is just that bit of fun, something I've been working on that I've not really managed to mend uh, concretely yet. Is who has the most commits? So we're looking at the last 12 months now and we're grouping by month. Now who commits the most in a monthly period? So we can see that last year, month eight, that Daniel Nelson had 64 commits. We see April 2020, we've got Joshua 62, we've got Johnny in December 2019, he's got 60. 
But please remember, we don't use a number of commits as a beating stick or assign our productivity, right? We just don't do that. But what we can do is to understand how people work. And this may be a really good way to try and work out how to get people to pair with each other. But if I filter this by Daniel Nelson, and say we take a look at 2019-8, that was the, the big command, we can see that the mean number of changes per his commits in that window was 60 files. Uh, 60 lines, 60 lines. He changed 60 lines, one mean per commit. Now, if we take a look at Jonathan, let's go to 2019-12. We can actually see that he had a, a lot of commits, right? So he's only a few behind, 60, but they're much larger. So what kind of inferences can we build there? Uh, well, because I work for the company, I know he's working on a new feature. So it's very easy for him to work in isolation and churn out lots of code as he iterates on that. Um, but it could also just be a sign that it might be worthwhile to have Daniel and Jonathan paired together to, to see and share the ideas about how they both commit. From what I can tell from Daniel's commits, and in fact, if we just jump back and take another look at that. Oh. Okay. So we can see that Daniel consistently has small commits. So 130, 85, 66, 130, 50. So they just have maybe different commit patterns. And getting them to pair together and share ideas. Daniel maybe likes really small commits that are tested. Jonathan prefers to get something working, take a step back, and sharing those ideas about how we work can just lead to new insights across the team. Now, this is going to be very difficult to work out how much time you spend coding if you join Influx because it's an open source product. So it's very difficult. Um, because we have all of those contributors that maybe push one or two things and then disappear. But for private organizations or private repositories, this dashboard could be a really good way to see if I join this team, how much of my time am I going to spend coding? Obviously, if you only spend two, three uh, days per, per month coding, that might not be the kind of role you're looking to. You might be looking for 12 days coding, 20 days coding, or even more. So we can just analyze the commits to see how much time will I actually push, how often will I push something to master? And the higher the better generally, because it just means the company, I feel, has a stronger release cadence, a stronger um, adoption of CI and CD. There are a lot of indicators there that make me feel comfortable. But again, these numbers are skewed in an open source context because of that heavy traffic of open source contributors. And of course, what we can also do is just understand when people commit and when they're taking a break. Now, we've already seen that Daniel and Johnny here have a very high degree of commits. Um, and we can actually use that as a way to say, when did they last have time off? You know, by looking at the commit history and saying that for any given week, if you push code more than three or four days per week, we consider that a week without time off. And how many weeks are you going without a break? Now, of course, it might just mean that they're working on something really important or having a good time and they're focused. That's all fine. But of course, it could also be an indicator that you just want to give them a wee nudge and say, hey, we'll take a few days off. You've been really great this week, this month, this, this year. Right? You can look at your team, you can understand what normal is, and try and promote better norms wherever possible. Okay, so everything we've covered so far gives us a really good look at our organization or your organization if you run this against that. But is there one more use case that would be really beneficial for development teams to analyze external Git repositories? And I think there is. So what we have here is one more InfluxDB instance. with the same dashboards, only it's analyzed in different repositories. So some of these, some of these uh, graphs are not going to make context, are not going to make sense here in this context. And I do not care about the total commits across these four repositories because what I'm actually analyzing is the four major open source front end frameworks. So I, I worked for an organization that maybe wants to build a UI or a single page application, and we're trying to make that decision. Angular, React, or Vue. And by analyzing these repositories, we can actually get an indication of the health and maturity of the community and the code. And what we see here is that React had a nice big flurry of commits in April 2019. But ever since then, it's actually kind of meandered down. 
what we see from the blue line is that Angular seems to be really consistent. There's always a high number of commits. Now, there's a few things we can understand there, and they're both good and bad. One, Google pays a lot of people to work in Angular, so the commit count's always high. That might be something that you want within your organization. You might want that support that this product is going to be always supported. React, on the other hand, it could just be an indicator that more people are contributing from an open source perspective, so hence the product is more open rather than controlled by a single entity. So, you know, you've got to really analyze it to, put, um, to suit your own needs. And if you skip past the total contributors, but again, look at the breakdown, we can see that consistency of contributors with Angular. To me, that is an indicator that Google is paying those, you know, what, eight to 10 people to consistently work on the product. Whereas what we see from React is that it actually comes and goes. And again, another indicator that the product is more open, relying on contributors, but you might want something from Google that is just actively um, supported all the time. And what we actually see here is that Vue seems to be not as prominent as the other two, but it still has a lot of people working on it. And from a, a release perspective, if that's important, you know, we can see Angular, again, has a very strong release cycle, or at least a really strong release cadence, and React does not. Again, what are you looking for? Does a strong or regular release cadence indicate a sign of, of maturity? Or do you want something that doesn't change as much? Um, you know, those, again, are decisions that you have to take a look at the data and decide what you want to do. And I'm not going to focus on... Uh, the helper functions at the bottom where we can find help with the extensions or the or the the files but you know if you did want to understand a piece of code more again you can use those same tools to do an external analysis of a repository of an external repository okay so what should you take away from all of this well it's really easy to get that data from the git history and store it in influxdb we have two tools available we use a go one just now that allows us to get line protocol from the Git, and then we can just pipe that line protocol to influx right on the CLI, job done. I'm not gonna promise you, you're going to you know, be able to change the world with the data that you get from your Git repository, but I do guarantee you that you can really establish a strong pulse or, hat, uh, <laughs> a strong pulse or heartbeat of your open source projects or even your private projects and how well they're you know how quickly they're moving and how mature they are from a release cycle etc like you can use that as a way to raise flags and alerts make sure people are taking enough time off reduce the size of your commits make your prs a bit better you know if you have a open source product and you're getting prs with 5,000 changes in each one open source people are either just going to reject it up front because it's too big or you're just going to get lgtms and you're going to merge and have a very fast moving product that doesn't work. So you can use these as, as a way to just maintain a nice health and heartbeat of your project. And again, I'm going to say this one more time. Commits are not a sign of productivity. They should not be used as such. Actually, what you should see is you should be able to pinpoint who the managers are in your company on those commit graphs. You know, high committers and then a, a drastic slope is not a sign that they're not doing any more work, but a sign that they're taking on more coaching, leadership, mentoring, paiding. Those are all really good signs. That's what you want to see. So this was just one data source. Yeah, what I really want to see next is someone pulling in issue trackers. When was the issue opened? When was the issue closed? When was the issue reopened? What metadata is attached to those issues? Tags, components, you know, all of that stuff. Because when we correlate the issues with the code, we can actually understand if we're working on the right things, the high priority things, and make sure that, you know, do we have a, a tranche of frequent commits from myself, say David McKay has 300 commits one month, and then our pager duty logs come in and we can see that there's a 600% increase in alerts the following month, right? You probably don't want me writing code into you. We can hook that in with Sentry. You join this all together. And what we could potentially have is a really good 360 view at the health of the people in our company, the code that we're writing and our production infrastructure. And I think that is really, really valuable. And I think we're only just scratching the surface of what is possible with novel uh, time series data sources. All right, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you found that interesting. The repositories we've already covered earlier. The other one that you need to take note of is gitlab.com slash raw code slash git series dash example. And there you're going to find the package or YAML manifest for all of the dashboards that we've already covered today. There's a couple more there that I didn't have time to cover. But feel free to go experiment, run it against repositories and let me know how you get on.
Thank you very much. Have a good day and I'll speak to you soon.